Welcome to our webinar on preparing for a successful implementation of the MDSAP program. I'm joined today with our presenter, Zahir. Zahir is a medical device uh, technical manager and GSO, and I'm very pleased to welcome. Thank you, Holly, for uh, this nice introduction, and thank you for all those that took from their schedule. I know it's now maybe uh, lunchtime, so we'll try to make this webinar as efficient as possible. So thank you for attending this presentation. It's a series uh, of a number of presentations. Uh, this is the third one for this month. Uh, we can, at the end of uh, this session, because I'm going to reference some of the items that were presented last week in case you haven't attended so we can share with you the recorded link uh, so the the topic today is the preparation for a successful implementation of the medical device the mdsap and the point that we thought that might be interesting for uh, for our uh, clients or for the industry is to, to see uh, the tools behind the scenes how we are training our auditors so the key, the three topics that we're going to cover is that we are training our auditors definitely to conduct an effective MDSAP audit, but what tools and in what mindset are we auditing our auditors? The second point is that what are the tools that they use so that we can point them out to you and for you so you can start preparing for those audits. And the last point is to highlight the differences between the perception of the service that you are after is it the MDSAP certificate that has the value no or yes and if no what then the value of the whole thing and this is where I'm going to highlight the MDSAP audit report so my name is Zahir Kharbutliya as Holly introduced me I'm the medical device technical manager I've been with SciGlobal for a number of years now uh, my, in my role, I go and I attend uh, every six months the MDSAP forum. So, so the forum is uh, hosted by the five regulators that are part of the MDSAP consortium. The five countries are Canada, US, uh, Brazil, and Japan, and Australia. So every six months when we meet, we exchange ideas, points, and calibrations. So it's about two, three days normally where we have a lot of uh, information and knowledge, and we feel it's important that we pass this information to, 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 the, to the industry. So my bio says everything about myself. Uh, to give you a brief background about the MDSAP, so again, this is a repeat. Apologies for those who attended last week. I'll try to make it a brief, but for those who uh, didn't have time last week, this is just a brief introduction. The, what is the MDSAP? And as you can see here, I'm uh, pointing out that there is the standard. And then we are looking at the Canadian flag. The reason is to uh, share with you the, the past model, the, the, the model that has been in, uh, implemented by Health Canada in order to subcontract the auditing uh, scheme to certain recognized organizations. So Sci Global was one of those organizations. So Health Canada didn't want to go and visit manufacturers. They don't have time for that. They were focused on the risk and the technical file review at their premises. So what the Health Canada decided or the model that Health Canada was after is to train auditors. So they were trained, they trained me, they trained our auditors and from other uh, recognized certification bodies and then they have subcontracted the accreditation to, to SEC Standard Council of Canada. Now Health Canada can attend office assessments, they can also go and attend witness audits to make sure that we are fulfilling all the requirements of Health Canada. So Health Canada, what they did in their candy cast model that expired in December 2018 is simply they took the standard, the 1345, so I'm not pointing out the old standard, but they took the standard and they said, well, you know what, the standard is fulfilling just throw a rough number, 70% of the regulations of the Canadians, of the, of the Health Canada requirements. And they said, well, there is a gap, and the gap are in these guidance documents where there are the additional 30% that we were trained on and they were monitoring if we are implementing those, uh, we were auditing those gaps on top of the 1345. So this is the candy cast model that existed in the past and has been working very well uh, until Health Canada started working with the other countries that are part of the INDRF, International Medical Device Regulation Forum, where Health Canada plus the US 
plus Australia, Brazil, and Japan, they started working together in 2014 in a program called the Anti-SAP. And the reason is that they wanted to make a collaboration. Uh, FDA is not having the sufficient resources in order to go and do inspections all over the world for manufacturers that are licensing their sites and licensing their medical devices to be sold in the US. So the FDA, that was their original model and still the existing one that still FDA inspections are taking place unless a manufacturer goes to the MDSAP program. And they said, okay, let's try to copy CAD the Canadian model. So they did the same thing under the MDSAP. They took the standard and they identified the gap and the gap now is identified and the, the, the manufacturers that are selling in to the US, now they can be also audited under the MDSAP. And again, by this to emphasize, the FDA will not inspect this uh, these companies unless there is like legal problem or fraud or whatever reasons. But in normal circumstances, the FDA will not inspect those manufacturers. So the same thing is applicable for the other countries. So I have added more details last week, uh, highlighting the background of the MDSAP. So they, there are other countries that are interested to join the program, but currently, uh, it's only limited to those five countries. Uh, one audit by one auditor, two auditors, depending on the audit team, that can cover the requirements of the countries where today the manufacturer is marketing, even if they haven't sold any product or selling their products. So, and if I take this example, sorry, if I take this example, if a manufacturer that is selling to Canada and the US, they don't have to comply with the requirements of the other countries. But on the contrary, if the client comes and says, I only want MDSAP for Canada, and we find out that they are selling for the US, so the auditors will define the scope and will say, well, ha -ha, you cannot only sell to, uh, you cannot only audit you to the Canadian requirements. Now it's mandatory that we see that you are also fulfilling the regulations of the FDA. So without further ado, you, here we are sharing the links of the FDA and Health Canada. Uh, the way that we are training our auditors all starts by using the perception of this whole service, this whole model. So uh, our auditors, basically they were 1345 auditors, 9001 auditors, maybe also auditors to other standards. So they were providing a service of auditing for quality management services. Now under MDSAP, it wasn't easy to change the mindset of those auditors. And the whole reason is that MDSAP auditing organizations, so under MDSAP, they call Site Global and other competitors in the market auditing organizations. In Europe, they call them not faith bodies, also, we can be called certification bodies. So there are different references, but under MDSAP, it's auditing organization. So SAI Global is auditing organization. So we are viewed, the, the product that we should be delivering the service for as an extension of a regulatory authority. So it's not as before, just doing an audit for a certification body. So regulatory audits, so when the auditor goes into your premises to start doing an MDSAP audit, the auditor is getting in with a mindset that they are conducting a regulatory audit. And the reason is that to meet the requirements of the regulatory authorities. Why? The, the MDSAP certificate or the MDSAP report that I will go more in details in a few slides, they, when they are skipping, or when they are, it's not skipping, when they are not visiting your facility for inspection, because now they have confidence that our auditors, they are fulfilling the same activities on their behalf, and we are trans, uh, transferring this information, the audit report is already transferred to those regulators, and they will go over those reports. Now, when they go over the report and they find that well, the auditor didn't cover specific information that, for example, the FDA was aware 
off, you are reporting to the FDA, you are getting clearances for certain devices, and if, if they see the auditor, well, didn't even reference this specific product, the FDA will question, well, that person was on site for three, four, five, six days and didn't reference anything about that product that the FDA are already aware of without visiting your facility. So the audit is thorough, there's a lot of preparations in advance. The tools that the auditors use are the existing databases that are for public sharing, so they can share, they can, they will access the FDA databases, the Health Canada MDAL databases, same thing for the other countries from the TGA and Visa and Japan, and from there they can already identify if you have a site registered, if yes, what's the number, when, when, when will be the renewal, what are the products that you are shipping or selling from those specific sites. <clears throat> so the tools that, uh, or the training, part of the training, and this is also for your information, I believe by now most of the manufacturers are aware of the information, where is it located. So just to give a highlight and uh, to be on the same uh, page, I'm going to highlight here the MDSAP documents. So when you go to Google and just type FDA MDSAP, you will get hit on this page, you will land on this one. Now if you press this button here, it will take you to another page. From here you will see that you have the MDSAP audit procedures and forms. Now there's other relevant and important information, but for the purpose of training the auditors, this is where we go, the MDSAP audit procedures and forms. And then from here you are going to see these two documents. This one is the audit model and this one is the companion document. So we monitor the information that is always hosted on the FDA website for the moment. MDSAP is preparing another platform to host their documentation, but currently this is where you as manufacturers, us as auditing organizations and our auditors, we are tracking these uh, revisions and reviews. So as you can see for the companion document, the latest review was April 2000. No, it doesn't say the date, but there was a newer uh, revision that's gonna be released soon. So to continue here, uh, the auditors across the globe, so we have auditors in North America, in the, in the East, in Taiwan, in Korea, so all auditors are expected to run the, the, the audit in the exact same way, in the same model. So in the past, when they were doing 1345, even in CAMTICAS audits, the auditor will send an audit plan and in the opening meeting when they visit the facility, they will tell the manufacturer, well, this is my plan, my plan is flexible, if you want to move stuff, please let me know. And sometimes there were like changes, uh, a manager, purchasing manager or designer is not available, so we'll say, well, you know what, instead of doing it day one, let's do it in day, the last day before the closing meeting. Now, under MD setup, this is not acceptable. And it's not that the auditors now are starting to be like more rude. No, it's that they are so they are expected of them to follow this model. And this is like an extract from the audit model from the audit model. Here I provided the reference. So when the auditor comes and is they start, they have to start by auditing the first chapter of management. So under MDSAP, they have taken the 1345 standard and they identified or try to decimate this standard into different processes. And the seven main processes identified in the 1345 measurement, um, sorry, management, device marketing authorization, as you can see by the color code and the arrow, arrows to see the relationship. After that, you have the measurement analysis and improvement, medical device adverse events, then we go to development, after that the production, and finally purchasing. Now, uh, here also to make it as a cheat sheet, I have identified the number of tasks in each chapter and how much time is expected from the auditor to spend for each task. Now, this doesn't mean that if it's 11, it's gonna stay 11, there might some, like for example, under production, if you don't do installation or services, this number will be 27 now instead of 29. So two tasks will be removed. If you don't do services, then it's going to go down to 26. No software device, so again, it's going to go down. Now, if you are uh, having more than one product, 
or modern production line, depending on the information the auditors have, they might increment the number of tasks. And this is how the whole thing will play out to come up with audit durations. So the auditors, when they are trained, we make sure if it's a single auditor, two auditors or more, that they have to follow this exact path. Uh, when you receive an audit, plan from the from the auditor it's very important that you go very carefully with this information and identify the people that need to be present so based on this model and let's say if it's a five day and the third day on the fourth day and it might happen some manufacturers say well you know what i don't run uh, production let's say on thursday and this will cause a problem so having back and forth with the auditor when you receive the audit plan and making sure who is going to be available at, during the audit is essential to avoid any surprises or delays in the whole process the the, the second thing is that you will see that the auditors when they start auditing management they will they need to be collecting information. And I have witnessed a number of auditors and I can still sense that the auditors, it's for them, it's not comfortable as it is for you as manufacturers, especially who already went through this experience uh, in their initial MD sub audits. So if you had an audit last year or the year before that, my point is that when they start asking about management, you will see that they are digging and they are collecting preliminary information that will help them auditing the following tasks. In an ideal situation where we have two auditors, so one auditor will start auditing management and the second auditor will start auditing device marketing authorization. The auditor doing this audit cannot rely and cannot audit certain tasks here unless he gets information from management so the exchange of information from between both auditors is crucial and that's why also auditors are are trained to be present at the same room so it's not like when we have two auditors we send one auditor to conference room a and conference room b both should attend the same room so that they can both exchange information live while you are there probably it's not convenient in a sense that there is noise and a lot of people in one room, but the communication here is very crucial and it's very important. So once you once the auditors follow this process, as I've said, the audit plan should be like that, the, the, the execution of the audit should be like that, and the reporting will be in the same uh, way, will follow the same way. Now, uh, when the second part of the, of the training for auditors is to use the audit model or the companion document. So just to, as a reminder, the audit model here or the companion document, these are complementary documents. So, and both are essential. Uh, when, we, when I'm going to be referencing the companion document all the time, that's because there's a lot of explanation and not leaving any room for wrong interpretations of the requirements. So just for the sake of this webinar, I have randomly selected this task. So this task number five is from the management process from this chapter. So task one, two, three, four, and then we have task number five. So I'm not gonna go in details and read word by word what doesn't mean, but the context or the structure of the NGSAP uh, model is like that. We have the task, and this task, for example, determine the extent of outsourcing of processes that affect conformity, la, 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 la. Now, an auditor in Taiwan might have a different interpretation of an auditor in, let's say, in Canada. And how can we make sure that all auditors are all after the same exact record when they are conducting the audit? The key point is in the assessing conformity. So I'm not displaying it in the screen, but it's very essential that when you are preparing for your audits is to go and spend more time over the assessing conformity because this will shed a lot of light. When an auditor is asking for something, probably they are not reading word by word, but this will may already prepare you for what the auditors are after. Now, the way this uh, the, uh, is structured, we, when we audit this task five, this already shows us under which clauses of the 1345 are already covered. So 
after each task, you will have the clauses of the standard, and then you will have the regulations for each of the individual countries, those that are applicable. So in this case, it's saying that this reference of the TGA Schedule 3 Part 1 is already covered going over this, but this doesn't mean it covered everything. There is still a missing element, and that's why we have an additional country-specific requirement covered under this paragraph. So in case you are selling or marketing, if your website say you are marketing and with an intent to sell there, then the auditors will audit this task. I will audit this additional requirement. If they see that you are not fulfilling that, then they will issue a non-conformity. If you are not selling there or making, not making any claims of selling your product at that territory, then this will not be covered during the audit. Then you, here we have the Anvisa requirements, and then we have the Japan requirements, and then we have the FDA requirements. So there are no additional requirements for Anvisa because it's not listed under the additional country-specific requirements. Same thing for Japan and same thing for the FDA. Now, for Canada, Health Canada identified that this task is missing an, an important point, and that's why they have also added the Canadian requirements under this paragraph. Now, for those who were in the past CAMDCAS, there's nothing new added. It's exactly the same regulations that were in the past covered under CAMDCAS. They are the same under MDSAP. So there's no new uh, requirements to go and check what do we need to cover. Also, here, what you are looking at is that it saved us a lot of time. The manufacturers, the auditors, the auditing organizations, and the reason is that you don't need now, if you want to go and expand and sell in Brazil, you don't need to go and translate what are the MVSA regulations. Uh, it's already spelled out with exactly the gap. So with other tasks, you will see MVSA details in English and for each of those countries, what is expected now from the manufacturer to include in their procedures and their quality manual in order to fulfill the requirements of MVSA. So the auditors, that's how they use this uh, each task. They read it in this way. And again, they go to the assessing conformity to uh, help them really and practically know exactly what they are looking for. The tools now, so I, show, I, sh I share with you how they read it. The tools now that they are using is, uh, Again, the audit model, the companion documents, they are writing the report in an audit report, so you can go and check this document. It's an Adobe uh, template that they download and they work on that. And also they have the nonconformity grading form that they use from here. Now, there are other documents that are uh, on this web page that the auditors have access and they might find, uh, find it, for example, they need to, to use, such as an example the medical device regulatory audit report policy. So the auditors, when they are writing their statements in the audit report, they reference most of the time to the policy to make sure that they are addressing the same language that is expected by each of the applicable countries. Now, the, 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 the challenge was what, and we have heard a lot of it in the uh, from from many manufacturers, even in the MDSAP forum when we attend there and uh, manufacturers are invited to those meetings, they are saying, well, we are seeing that the auditor is asking the same question more than once, and when we show them a record day one. We are puzzled, why are we still going to show them the same record to, for the second time and third time and fourth time? It doesn't make sense. And we hear you and the MDSAP also hears you and all goes back again to the training of the auditor and how the auditor and what kind of questions are asking. Plus the auditors might be after specific thing that you might believe you already showed the information in day one. So to shed light, I have made this uh, slide where you are looking at is on the first left column is the 1345-2016. So we have the closes from 4.1 all the way to 8.5. So just for the sake of this example, I only selected, and again randomly, the close 5.2, which is the customer focus. Now, here on the top row, you're looking at management, 
device marketing authorization, measurement analysis, adverse events, design, production, and purchasing. So here I'm sharing with you the seven chapters of the MDSAP. And again, as per the expectations of running the audit, the auditors should cover, cover chapter one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And what I have done also is identified the task number that references the close of the standard. So just to go back a few slides, when I was going over this example, I told you under task number five, it identified which close of the standard it was referencing. So for task number 10, I'm going back to the same slide, under task number 10, it already references task number, uh, close number 5.2 of the standard. And then when we go to the following chapter, we'll see that the same close will be called again under task number one, two, and three. And again, under task number 16 for measurement analysis improvement, we don't have some anything for adverse events that calls this close. Then we have it under design, production, task 25, 29, and purchasing. So all those tasks are coming from the audit model. These are the reference numbers. And all of those tasks, they are referencing exactly to the same close of the standard. So this shows you that in the past, when auditors were doing a simple 1345 audit and they asked this question, yeah, it makes sense to have the manager that is responsible for, let's say, the, uh, developing contracts, signing them, seeing what are the needs of the of the manufacturer, then the, of, the, of the client, and that's it. We don't go over and over and see the same person. Now, the, 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 the ideal practice is that the auditors are identifying what is or who is your clients, who are the major clients, what are they buying without going in depth and reviewing the contracts at that specific task. Now, this task, when you go over it and you can check it under the companion document, you will see that it will make a pink box that it's referencing the output, the information taken from here, is going to be taken over to the device marketing authorization and facility registration, which means the auditor, when he audited the management, he already picked up the name of one, two, three clients, depending on their data that they are after, and they're going to pass it over to the following chapter. So if it was the same auditor, the same auditor will go over it. If it was two auditors, so that this auditor is expected not to go in depth and to pass this information to the other auditor that is doing the advice marketing authorization, facility registration, so they can use it to start from where the first auditor stopped. So to go back to this flow chart, I'm going back again here. You see this, so the auditor when they auditing task number 10, they are going to cover very basic preliminary superficial information and pass it over to device marketing authorization. So now this auditor can go down to a certain level, but after that, whatever information they have received, they will pass it to measurement analysis uh, and improvement. And then this information will be led, taken over to design development, production, and purchasing. So uh, it's not easy as, as, uh, as, a, uh, as a method. Auditors were not used to do that in this specific way, structured way. And now further and further, they are more uh, accepting the idea. And we wanna make sure also that manufacturers understand why auditors are asking those information. So this arrow here, it has nothing to do with medical ev adverse events. No, no, this arrow is just because it's highlighting all the tasks that are all coming from the audit model. The, the, the last point on our presentation today is to highlight and differentiate between the MDSAP audit report and the MDSAP certificate. So the expectations, again, is that you are after service because at the end you want to license your product in Canada. And just as a reminder, the MDSAP is only mandatory today for Canada licensing purposes. Now, if it happens that you are selling to Canada and the US, you cannot say, I only want Canada. Now it also becomes mandatory for the US requirements. So when the auditor goes and starts their audit, they are thinking in 
they, they change hats. We are talking about five countries, so each country has its own requirements that are sometimes they are the same as the other countries, but most of the time they are different. So the MD sub audit, it has the QMS focus, quality management system, which means this is where the certificate can be presented and the certificate has a value. And only two of the five countries that will take the MDSAP certificate and use it for renewing licenses and for uh, registering a new product. Now, for Australia, they have a specific thing, which is somehow in the middle that falls here, where they will also expect to see the audit report. Now, back to, the, to, to this slide, where I'm trying to differentiate, on the left is the countries that are after the certificate, and on the right are the countries that are after the site, site specific. So the three countries that focus on sites is the US, Japan, and Brazil. Now, what does that mean? What, how this will impact the industry or your, your facilities? We, for example, let's take a, a client, client X comes and say, well, I would like to get license my product. I've had my product for the past 15 years, for example that has been licensed with Health Canada now. And my product is A, and I would like to have a scope on the certificate that only covers product A. Now, okay, we take this information and that we see, uh, that we have online based on the information provided. So when we go and see the FDA website, well, we see, well, okay, well, this manufacturer said for this site, they declare to the FDA that they have products A, B, and C. Now, remember, the manufacturer only wants on the NDSAP certificate a scope for product A. So now, when we go and when the auditor goes and do the audit, they, are, they have specific selection criteria. It's not random. It's not like, this is the last change I did for this device. No. In the companion document under the assessing conformity, you will see that there is specific criteria to select which design to select. Now, based on those criteria that can start with the, pro with the product that had a recall with our advisory events or the highest NCRs. So if the auditor is on site and you expect to receive an MDSF certificate for product A, but you're having a lot of issues under product B, the auditor will opt, will not audit product A at that moment, will focus on product B. And the reason, again, is that for that example, Client X is selling to Canada and the US. So we need to show to the regulators that the auditors follow the audit model based on the information available on site. They need to cover now all the products, A, B, and C. The reason for selecting product B is in fact due to the following criteria. So we have like five criteria in the companion document for design selection. And also we have other criteria for production. Based on this information, the auditors will take their decisions. Now, when the audit is done, NCRs are closed, what, what's next? The next phase is that you come after Psy Global and say, well, you know what? I have done my audit three months ago, still I need my certificate, we are behind, and these are challenges that we are aware of, and also the MDSAP and all competitors in the market, and we send you the certificate. But what you should be also after is the audit report. Now, this is essential, and the reason is that the, the countries on the right they will only renew and amend and add new devices based on those audit reports. So the value of the service that you are after is not to focus only on the certificate, but on both. Plus, those reports, they are shared with the five countries regardless. Now, even if you are not selling to Japan, this report is on the on. on, on their uh, database and in the, in the future if you decide to add any of those countries you can and i have covered that in the last uh, last week's webinar where we will not going to do like from scratch a new md sub audit we will cover those specific requirements for japan and now japan when they go and license your product for the new site and the new product they can go and access the past audit reports so this is what i wanted to cover and make sure that it's clear why we are talking about focus on QML management system and site focus. As a recap here, 
Sci Global and other competitors, we are an extension of regulatory authorities and we have to do our job in the same level of their expectations. We want to make sure at the end of our service is that we are delivering to those regulators what they expect so they can expedite your registration and the renewal process with each of those countries that are applicable for you. The few points that I have raised up last week and still I find them they are very important is to have a very efficient and good preparation for the uh, for the NDSAB. Don't uh, just focus on the audit model document. Companion document has a lot of key information and all is falling under the keyword in red here, which is assessing conformity. Now, there's a lot of text, there's a lot of things to read under the companion document, but this is what we are training our auditor. We are investing a lot of time to make sure that the auditors are going over each of those guidance after each task. If you look at the whole audit model, in total there are 1092 tasks. There are 75 guidance or pointers that fall under assessing conformity to tell the auditors not to randomly or interpret the task in their own way. No, sorry for repeating it for the third time. It's rather to know exactly what they want and to make sure that it's clear for them to make it easier for you to know what you have to show them. So developing a gap between the companion document and your current quality management system procedure, identifying under each task what which procedures fall, which procedures to cover will expedite and facilitate the auditing process under MDSAP. You can have make a table, you can tab make a matrix so that your internal audit team and the external MDSAP auditors when they visit your facility, they know exactly under each task which procedures fall under this category. For those manufacturers that they are selling to more than one country, and then they are selling this product A to this country, and then for the other, for let's say for another country, they are selling the three products ABC. So they are shouldn't be surprised from the auditors how they are selecting their criteria. It's not at all based on the certificate that they are uh, they have written in their in, in their in their contract. All products sold to any of the five countries will be part of the scope of the audit. Last point that I will go briefly here, which I went in details in the last week webinar, is the NCRs. What is the timeline to close and clear NCRs? So under the NDSAB, the NCRs, they are not as it was the past practice, minor and major. Now it is either grade one, two, three, four, and the maximum is five. So five is bad, really bad. One, two, three is like, it's okay, it's acceptable. So for any of those NCRs from one to five, today the manufacturers that go into MDSAP, they have 15 days to send back a response to the auditor with the root cause, corrections, and corrective actions. So in the previous programs, depending on the certification body, normally this would be 30 days, three, zero, 30 days. So here I'm talking only 15 days under MDSAP. And that on top of those 15 days, you have additional 15 days for NCRs that are graded to grade four and five. So in total, you have 30 days now for any NCR grade four and grade five to submit objective evidence of the corrective actions. Uh, that was the intent of today's webinar, is to share the tools that we had with our auditors, how we are training them, and how they are executing their anti-SAP audits. Again, if you have any questions, Holly? Thank you so much, Sahar. That was a really good overview. Lots of compliments, so thank you very much. Um, we do have a couple of questions here. Um, all right. Can you just comment, if they're going to make uh, the auditors an extension of the regulatory authorities, does that not mean that they would have law enforcement powers, so similar to um, deputizing a civilian into law enforcement? Can you... So here we're still talking NDSAP, correct? And correct, we're talking yeah. about the FDA? 
Yeah, so or we're talking like about any, any regulators? Yeah, the, so how the how do the, the I guess the regulators um, perceive that extension of authority? How does that sort of um, how is that perceived by external parties, or is it just really an extension of the function that they would um, audit the organization? No, so it's it's only an extension of that specific process, which is the the auditing the quality management system and the facility registration. But if there is like let's say a fraud where we a manufacturer says that we find that the manufacturer is selling a product that is not registered in that specific uh, country we would issue an ncr and the closure of the ncr is going to take the regular path between the manufacturer and the auditing organization now if we take it to another level of our extent where the manufacturer says i'm using these let's say implantable devices that have the following sterilization safety reports. And we find that those reports were falsified. This will also go into the ANDISAP report and NCRs. Now, at those very extreme situations, the regulators, they might step in, but it's not us because we are documenting, but the law enforcement is not for us. Then they will go and use the evidence that we have reported and we have documented in our reports, and they will take over for the legal actions. Yeah, that makes sense. Good summary. Um, has the FDA adopted the ISO 1345 standard as the base requirements to be within the MDSAP program? So today, the FDA, let's say since May 2018, now almost a year ago, they have uh, posted on their website uh, a, 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 like uh, how to say a case study of replacing the QSR with 1345-2016. And currently the FDA is busy to identify the gap and how this will impact the future of manufacturers. So, so far I didn't answer that question. The, end, the FDA today, they are very active and keen in seeing how they can adopt the 1345-2016 as a standard alone. To answer the question, the, today the FDA, they have two models. The past model, which is still currently in practice. What is that? I have a device that I would like to sell in the US. Okay, I say, well, is it something that is similar to another product in the market? Yes, so I request a 510K, I submit it to the FDA and the FDA will review my application. And based on that, they will say, okay, well, this is your license. Now, the FDA might, come inspect me in the same year or in the following years to come depending on a lot of factors specifically the risk of the device this is the the model that the fda had in the past and is still using alternatively the new model is MDSAP. under MDSAP, they said well you know what since we are already receiving the MDSAP report they are doing their office review without going in person and doing the inspection on site conditionally that they have all the information documented in the audit reports. So that's why I made this section where scope, we always want to make and assure the FDA and the other regulators where that we are doing on their behalf all everything that they expect from us. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, so going on to the gap analysis. The old and the new one. Sorry, Zahir, I beg your pardon. So going, moving on to the gap analysis, using the comparison, com, companion, companion document. document. Sorry, I thought it was comparison. Is it an expectation that the time required would be longer than the actual audit? It has no impact at all. So that the determination of the audit duration follows an MDSAP procedure that is also available for the public on the website. The reason I made this recommendation as gap so that the manufacturers know, put their self, like simulate, they are doing already internal audits, so they can do it in a like, okay, very fast way, but or to do it due diligently. The best practice we found is that the, 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 the manufacturers take this document very seriously and develop a gap so that no surprises when an auditor is on site and asking for a specific document and the audit or the manufacturers is a bit puzzled and not knowing why this document is asked at that specific time of the audit plan. It all goes back, where are the assessing conformity uh, interpretations? 
Okay. So it will not impact adding or reducing the time. Okay. If a company is not selling in Japan yet, does the auditor still need to audit to Japan's regulations? Because that's part of MDSAP. If they are not selling and they are not claiming that they sell there, no, they will not be audited to the Japan requirements. Okay. Are NCRs only the level four and five? Yeah. Okay. No, the NCRs can be any, but well, from one to five are NCRs. But the ones that are grade one, two, and three, they have only to show the auditor that they have identified the root cause, what are the corrections, and what is the long-term corrective action. They share this information to the auditors. Now, same thing they need to do for grade four and five, all of that within 15 days. Okay. The difference is that for those that are grade four and five, we need to see the implementation within another 15 days. So we don't need to see the same thing for grade one, two, and three, but for grade four and five, yes, we wanna see the implementation of the corrective action. Okay, very good. Is it expected to share the gap analysis of the companion document with the auditor? No, no, not at all, no. Okay, um, the question of the time for the gap is that agreeing that the gap should be to the companion document, but companies seem to want the gap analysis to go very quickly. So if so, will the gap analysis be shared before or during the audit? Well, uh, we, when, we, when you have an auditor and the auditor is trying to do their job, personally, I would have a more smooth audit like that. The audit will go very easily when I have access to the internal audit or to the gap. And the reason is that the auditor is going to be on site maybe for four or five days, it depends. And they are trying hard to identify which procedure, which document. And at the end of the day, if it's still the auditor, it's not clear for them, they might take a path to issue an NCR and all goes to communication. Having access to that gap will make sure that there's no uh, miscommunication there and that we have provided the auditor with all the information but again it's not mandatory I'm not saying that the but the audit the, the sharing the management review which is the most crucial thing at the manufacturers they're already sharing it with the auditor the internal audits are shared with the auditor now I don't see why sharing the gap would make any difference okay very good I think those are all of our questions. Let me just do a quick scan. Indeed they are, very good. Thank you so much, Sahir. And thanks everyone for your attendance today. We'll share a link to the recording as well as the slide deck within a few business days. Um, have yourself a wonderful day. Thanks everyone. Okay, bye.